Welcome to the 10th edition of the Social Distancing Jazz Show. My guests today are three talented pianists that happily I've been able to play with and work with. Richard Tartle Hammer was born in Queens, New York in 1958. Tartle started playing piano at the age of five, after which he played clarinet and guitar and came back to the piano when he turned 13. At age 15, he had formed his own sextet. After high school, Tardo moved to New York to work professionally. By the 80s, he became a regular in clubs around town and began working with such musicians as Bill Hardman, Junior Cook, Lionel Hampton, Lou Donaldson, and the art farmer Clifford Jordan Quintet. Tardo made his recording debut alongside Al Cohn and Mel Lewis in trumpeter Al Persino's big band. He has accompanied jazz vocalist Annie Ross, Earl Coleman, David Allen, Abby Lincoln, Terry Thornton, Marion Collins, and John Hendricks. Tardo has been performing in clubs and festivals in Europe, Japan, and the U.S. In 1999, Tardo began making trio recordings as a leader. His sixth and most re recent album is Swinging on a Star, recorded for Cell Alive. <clears throat> Excuse me. He appears as a sideman on CDs by Warren Vache, Charles Davis, Grant Stewart, as well as on my own CDs. Tardo is on the faculty of the Lewis Moses School, the New School, and the Special Music High School, as well as conducting classes and lessons at clinics and colleges worldwide. Keith Saunders grew up in Van Nuys, a suburb of LA, and studied improvisation with the vibraphonist Charlie Schumach. He worked with Roy McCurdy, Bill Holman, Bill Watrous, and Dick Burke, and they encouraged him to move to New York City. To our dismay and to the Bay Area's relief, Keese has moved to Albany, San Francisco. During his 26 years in New York, Keith worked with Richie Cole, Hank Crawford, Mickey Roker, Ralph Lama, Frank West, Valerie Ponomarev, as well as with my quintet for several years. In 1991, he became the leader of the New York Hard Bop Quintet, a cooperative unit featuring Joe Magnarelli and Jerry Weldon. The band was together for eight years and recorded four CDs on the TCB label. Keith has also re uh, recorded as a sign man with Jerry Weldon, Andrew Beals, and John Dooley, and his debut CD, Lost in Queens, was released in April of 2010 on TCB, and features my friends and fantastic musicians, bassist Bim Strasberg and drummer Tao Okamoto. Keith taught beginning piano for 10 years at the Sacred Heart School in Yonkers, New York, and is enthusiastic about teaching children and loves the Mets. Piano composer Raphael DeLugoff has worked with such diverse artists as Betty Garrett, Leon Parker, Joel Fromm, and James Levine, and also with my trio. Raphael works regularly at Mesro and Fat Cat, which is a really cool jazz club pool hall, where he has hired me and his quintets and quartets and has wonderful groups. In 2010, he recorded his first CD as a leader in a quartet setting called Sandbox. Raphael has been stylistically influenced by Monk and Winton Kelly. Let me get these gentlemen online. And... Yay! Hey guys, how are you? Hey, Vitaly. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. It's not really morning, it's two o'clock, but jazz time, it's morning for me. Uh, let me start with Raphael. Uh, Rafi, besides being um, one of New York's premier pianists, your father was Art DeLugoff, who opened the Village Gate, um, a jazz club in the heart of New York City's Greenwich Village in 1958. Geez, I used to go there and I saw Woody Shawn many great artists. Your dad, dad hired such jazz artists as Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, Daz Dizzy Gillespie, Aretha Franklin, and, and Miles Davis, as well as comedians Bill Cosby, Mort Sal, Woody Allen, and John Belushi. That certainly explains why we both love comedy, uh, which I feel is very close to jazz and how important timing is and the way it is presented. Uh, your mother, Avital Delugoff, worked as a photographer. How did that impact uh, of your father owning a jazz club and your mother being a photographer influence your career in music, uh, Raphael? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, since I was young, I, I got to see a lot of uh, 
music and also uh, musical theater, I was able to see um, a show called Jacques Brel uh, is Alive and Well. <clears throat> Had a lot of, uh, of his songs performed. And, you know, I saw that show maybe a hundred or so times when I was 10 or 11. And, you know, a lot of the songs were about very grown up things. Uh, um, and they were very emotional. It was a lot for a 10 year old. So, I mean, I was exposed to a lot of stuff. Um, I was very indecisive about music. Uh, I, I got a degree in uh, English literature and then um, I was kind of, you know, very undecided. And then my dad was uh, nice enough to say, look, if you can get into a music school, uh, I'll pay for it. And I'd already wasted four years at, you know, getting a useless English degree. So I went to New England Conservatory where I was, uh, had to play a little bit of catch up. And, uh, so, so um, you also worked at uh, one of the, at your dad's clubs. Uh, yeah, I, I, and... I booked musicians and, and comedians from, from like 1988 to 1993. And this was in the, in the era of the, uh, answering machine. So every comedian and, and, and jazz musician in New York would call me and ask me for gigs. And, you know, uh, well, I really- Could you name some names, Raphael, of the comedians, for instance, or musicians? Well, uh, not, to, not to name drop, but let's see, Larry David, name uh, drop. Ray Romano, Ray Romano uh, John Stewart, wow. um, Bill Hicks, Louis C.K., uh, Mark Marin. Were, they were all kind of starting out or in, you know, in mid-career. Brett Butler, not the baseball player, but the, the yeah. Cool. Uh, I have a question now for uh, Keith. Uh, Keith, now that we can wash our hands in chlorines three times a day, has it affect your playing? Let me uh, that's tell not, you something, Richie. <laughs> that's not the real question. Finally got around to getting me on the show. <laughs> the uh, the but, but real question. Was Bernie busy? <laughs> Um, that was uh, Keith Saunders' hater um, character, which actually uh, rivals my show, and we'll talk about that a little later. How Keith got into that? I was, what, I was, I was on a pit here. Uh, I, I had to sleep with to get on this show. <laughs> I asked my friend. Uh, Keith, you um, uh, when you now you that we're in lockup mode, and uh, do, has your practice routine changed in any ways, Keith? Do you practice less or, or more, or are you practicing differently now that, well, we don't have any gigs? And <laughs> so okay. what, how does it change? Like, I don't try to play as high now. I'm not playing split lead. And sometimes I go right to the meat of the stuff. I'm actually practicing stuff that seems more important in some ways. It's kind of weird. How about you, Keith? I've actually stopped playing the high notes on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> don't need them. Uh, practicing more. I, I, I don't have to, to to drive anywhere to gigs and teach. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I actually am I'm playing more classical music than I did before. You know, so I, 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 have, I have more time for that. And um, I said I was going to learn as many bird melodies as I can, but I, I have not done that, but I've, I've composed a few things. And um, Good, yeah, you're a great yeah, composer. I'm playing, and, I'm playing and, most every day. And what yeah. else also happened in my apartment building, I live in a unit with a building with three people. And somehow the guy in front of me is just must be social distancing somewhere. He's not around. But, and then the people in back of me moved out. So I'm wow. kind of it, it's yeah. your own pad. What kind of um, composers? Uh, Brahms, Chopin, Bach. What are, What are your some of your favorites? Uh, well, I always like Beethoven the most. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning a Beethoven sonata now, and um, Chop I'm learning. Sh I'm, I'm into Chopin and um, and Bach. Not well. Then yeah. not too bad. Uh, and but... I've got a Prokofiev sonata that I've been I've picked up and I've tried to you know the last year or two, and I, I think that's going to be next. Because I, I, you know, it's, it's is it number pretty, seven? Um, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to find it. I'd, I'd, and sure. uh, uh, Tardo, when you got your first recording date as a leader, did you jump and down, up and down in excitement as I did? I remember I got my first TCB recording with Gary Bartz, and I literally, I mean, at that age, I was so excited. How did, how did you feel about? Oh, 
you know, I'm, I'm get anxious, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, what are you going to play? And then you got to deal with the producer. They have things. And then who, who are you, who are you, who are you going to play with? Uh, right. Will the producer approve that kind of stuff? And then, you know, uh, recording can be, mm -hmm. so, I mean, speaking about being like in quarantine and all that stuff, it's really very not stressful to not go to gigs. Yeah. Not have to prepare for gigs. Like I got a call. I might go, I might have a gig in July and immediately I felt my blood, blood pressure go up just a little bit. Like, <laughs> well, what am I going to play? Who am I going to play with? How am I going to get there? You know, well, I wear two masks. I don't know. Just you start, you start, you know, so I don't miss that aspect of it. So, well, yeah, a record, a first record date is a little bit of a nerve. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not completely anxiety ridden, but I would say that there's a lot of issues that start churning around that you have to resolve. Yeah. Repertoire, arrangements, that, all that stuff. You know, I never felt that kind of nervousness because the record company I worked with, TCB, they didn't ask me or challenge who I wanted to use. I mean, I did, I'm not as recorded as some other guys, but I've had complete control. And also my last two projects were uh, self, you know, uh, I did myself so that mm -hmm. all that, uh, so it wasn't any problem there, but yeah, that could be a problem. Uh, I mean, I'll uh, say one other, one other thing is that I need somebody to say, hey, I'm going to record you to, to do it. Like I've uh, somebody to put a deadline yeah and say i'm I'm actually going to pay you to do this yeah it's deadlines are important. It kind of helps, right. helps get me to the finish line yeah uh brooke meyer told a story once he said uh, something about somebody who had to be enlightened and he said well you have six months and he didn't get enlightened well you have three months and then he said well if you're not enlightened by tomorrow you're gonna die you know and he was like <laughs> enlightened the next day so, so deadlines are good <laughs> like that, yeah. Yeah. deadlines are good but uh did, did the uh record producers actually tell you who to use or did they influence you in that way or, uh, i mean their choices uh, are often really good the chris we, we might and, kick around personnel so you know i mean there's there's different concerns and producers i mean they have to they have a budget and they have to figure out how they're going to make it work. So I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. Sometimes they want you to have a name. Somebody's considered, you know, there's all these uh, ways that people are considered to be good draw or will help sell the disc or right. or is a, a hot commodity or is associated with success. You know, a bunch of things that we don't always think about. And they're usually excellent musicians, so it's yeah. not a problem. Raphael, uh, when you prepare for a gig, uh, you have great charts, but they're minimal. How does that help with the looseness and the spontaneity of a performance? Uh, you know, I mean, I think you'll agree that, like, um, if you choose an, a, a really nice tune, you don't want to burden it with too many uh, chords. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, you want to put a stamp on it so maybe it you know it's a kind of um it's a decision that you have to make you don't want to make it too fancy but you you want to respect the, the tune and and you're playing a tune for a reason because you want to hear the melody the right way but then you don't want to just play it in a sort of pre-digested way that everyone else plays it so it's it's just a kind of a fun thing to balance in your head um i mean you don't need like a million slash chords maybe just half a million there you go. <laughs> well, you're really good at that, and and so was Art Farmer, and and uh, and uh, he had great charts, but they, he had his personal touch, but nothing too complex. Or, you know, I'm beginning to be more and more sympathetic to the audience than I was when I was younger, learning my my horn. I, in fact, when I this may not work with all artists, but I would keep the audience at a distance, but. The more I learned about my horn and the more confident I felt in myself, um, the more I invited them in. I like talking to the audience. I like getting, it's challenging to write songs that I think I really uh, enjoy playing. They're not lying to myself, but still people would like. So I think it's important to think about the audience. There's not, a, there are a few jazz musicians I, I've listened to like three quarters of the set and I go, 
oh God, finally a blues, you know? So it's, it, I mean, great musicians, but even if I don't understand it and I'm not enjoying it, me being a musician, I'm wondering what are the people in the audience thinking? So you're really good at that and drawing in the audience and I'm, I'm working on that. Can, uh, can I just tell you, this is vaguely related to what you said, but uh, this is one th one funny thing my dad said to me once. We had Betty Carter playing at the Village Gate. And as you know, Be Betty Carter liked to do <laughs> extremely slow tempos. This is a crazy slow tempo. So in the middle of w one of her, her sets, my dad comes up to me and goes, he goes, two ballads in a row? Two ballads in a row? <laughs> <laughs> had to be there for this. Yeah. No, it, no, it was funny. I just had you on uh, pinned view, so you can see us laughing. <laughs> oh. Keith, uh, Keith um, <laughs> I'll try to laugh loud with the pin. <laughs> Keith, why do you like the Mets so much, and which baseball team sucks the most? Which? Uh, mm. <laughs> Richie, can you give me a, a bigger softball than that? Yeah. <laughs> it goes with, without saying it's the New York Crankies. At the, uh, well, I, um, uh, I, I came to New York in 1984, and um, I thought I was going to be, you know, uh, rooting for this team of lovable losers because the, the Mets have been terrible since 1975. And um, they happened to get good. Right away, you know, like uh, that. '84 was the year that Doc Gooden came came uh, in, and and uh, there was something about that team. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. lived in New York at that time knows they they had some kind of um, orneriness and and some kind of um, you know uh, some something really uh, special. And um, yeah, I, I kind of I got into them, and and um, of course they won in '86, and then. Pretty much since then, it's been, uh, you know, heartbreak and uh, and despair. But uh, yeah, that's that's the jazz musicians' uh, motto, I think. So we're yeah. waiting for them to make the big comeback. Uh, yeah, well, that may happen. I hope. <laughs> and how did you come about with um, uh, with your whole hater vision? I, I watch sometimes. I I go on TV and. Uh, Keith has a Facebook program, folks, called The Hater, which rivals uh, my own program in many ways. And I was wondering, how did you develop The Hater, and do you expect it to go into syndication? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the workshopping that goes into it is, is, is really intense. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, it is spontaneous, and I, and I marvel yeah. at that. And that's something I wanted to mention about jazz pianists. Like, I look at uh, Tom Harold used to put his charts in Manila. This is what I heard. Manila envelopes. And when, I'm not talking about charts. I'm talking about specific parts, like the trumpet part. He would pull out pull out the tenor part. Pull out. And me, I do like I, uh, like I heard Art Frogger does. I put them in plastic uh, protectors and put them in a... But, Piano players, the way they play and the way they improvise and the way the hater goes, I mean, it's so spontaneous. It's like kind of crazed. And do, do, Can I get a word in edgewise, sir? You asked me a question. Is this, is this, out loud. Does that have something to do with piano player and the hater that you could just improvise and, and do like a half an hour cooking show and make people laugh? I'm, okay. Sorry, that was a Can I long way to... It was a long ways to the question. I wanted to apologize. <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. I had a whole. Well, you forgot speech. the question. Uh, okay, so here, here's here's the story of of Hater Vision. When Facebook introduced its live platform, I noticed it shortly after. I said, "This this looks fun. I'm going to go on." So I, I go on, you know, on my phone, and you know, all of a sudden you're you're live, and you realize you have to do something. You know, so what am I going to do? Read the phone book? So I just started ranting about something that was bothering me. And I probably stayed on way too long that, that time. But, it, you know, it was, it was kind of fun. People liked it. And eventually, it, it really what it, what it is, is kind of a response to this, this Facebook uh, humble bragging, social media, and everybody's bragging, you know, um, I, I'm so honored that... Uh, 
uh, Jack McDuff loved my playing or, you know, to insert famous <laughs> jazz musician here. So that became a way for me is basically, as you guys know, as kind of an introverted person, I could say whatever I wanted to. Nobody's going to take it seriously because it's Keto. And so I could get, like, it kind of became cathartic for me to, to get a lot of shit off my chest. That, that you know in in a humorous way um and then then after after a while it's it's like you you kind of run out of ideas and now i can only really do it like a couple of times a year or you know or, or you know i actually that's actually more contrived now than it was because i just can't keep talking about the same thing there's only so much i could say about andy watson <laughs> i think it's uh, almost weekly and Raphael says did you see that keith saunders do the hater and i said well, I'll have to check. I mean, people love it. Your your audience is quite uh, large. And uh, were you doing this pre-COVID, by the way? Was it? Uh... Pre-COVID? I've been doing it for like 20 years. What are you talking oh. about? You know, it's, <laughs> well, how on. long live <laughs> platform is it? Like three it's, years or however it's, long it's, we've been able to go live on, cool. on Facebook. Cool. Uh, let me move on to, I want to ask Tardo. I invented COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tard, I, I actually I knew Art Farmer. Uh, he had uh, given me one of my most important lessons ever. It was uh, <clears throat> I was singing um, a song named Rain Check, and I says, "Hey, Art, there's this one place, but up, 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 a little, and it's over in E7, and he's kind of playing notes that didn't belong there, like an F minor major." And I go, "Art, you played these notes," and he goes, "Oh yeah, I know what that is." And he took his whole break to explain to me what. Uh, 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 um, the altered chord was George mm -hmm. Russell's theory about the major uh, 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 sharp four, sharp five, and and how he uses it. And he actually says, "I love that chord." I never heard somebody say, "I love a chord." But Art wow. was so nice to take a half an hour, and it was like a breakthrough, kind of like uh, epiphany, like Barry Harris's classes were for me. Uh, for that that half an hour kind of turned around my playing. You actually worked with Art Farm and Clifford Jordan, and I didn't even know that. What what was that like working with with Art and Clifford? I mean, well, I love Clifford. Yeah, first of all, it was great. I mean, they were two of the greatest musicians that I've ever met. Um, you know, there are always things you wish that you had done, like, like I would be sitting next to Art. Art was really introverted, and I'm not a big you know, talker either, especially with guys like that, that I admire. I'm kind of humbled and I wait to be, wait to speak when I'm spoken to and that kind of thing. And then lo long afterwards, like this happens a lot. I say, boy, I wish I had asked him this. I wish I had asked him that, but it's just not something. So we would spend a lot of time not talking. Yeah. That's kind of like, you know, uh, when, uh, when I, I wish that I could talk to Art Farmer now, and Woody yeah. Shaw was my teacher. The questions that I have would be perfect now. That's like, the way I look at it too. You're exactly I right. I mean, it, and it wasn't, it, it's like I'm hanging in Woody Shaw's in my car, but I'm in awe of Woody Shaw, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, kind of taking lessons. I took what he gave me, but now I have so many questions for both of those cats. But uh, people tell me that it's time for us to start answering questions uh -huh. instead. And I don't know if we're going to answer them as well. But uh, okay. that's that's going to be our uh, duty. But uh, it it must have been. What clubs did you work uh, with Cliff, Clifford and Art at? By uh, Sweet Basil mostly. Yeah. And uh, we in Jersey. I think one of those places like Trumpets or one of those places in Jersey. We played in uh, Boston, Regatta Bar. Um, I didn't go much further than that. I didn't go overseas with them. What were the New York clubs again? Sweet Basil. Oh, Always you Sweet know, Basil. I he would come for I'd... two weeks very, every f six months or so. Damn it. I wish I had saw and, him. Um, I, I, I went and saw him. I wasn't always times. there, but I was kind of in between. I don't know who was there right before me. People were coming and going, and then uh, Jeff Keezer came in after me. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. What a and new Clifford thing. Clifford was a little more instructive. Art Art would the guys were like they used to joke around and say, Well, does he dig what we're doing? Because he shows no approval or says nothing encouraging. Art was very old school that way. Clifford was that way too, but he he had little cryptic 
lessons he would give you. Yeah, uh, Art was very quiet. In fact, you could almost say shy, I guess, in some ways. And, I'm sure and that, Clifford, yeah. Actually, I used to hang out with Clifford at his, now that I'm thinking back, you know, I used to get high with him till like yeah. six or eight in the morning. And and, it's, it's, and uh, he would pull out a book of uh, tenor players and he would be looking at guys from the 30s and 40s and telling me that, uh, now I know Earl Bostick and I know yeah. Coleman Hawkins and, and Ben Webster, but he's going through guys like 10, 20 years before that. And, and I'm going, man, a guy that plays this modern, no wonder, because he's so rooted. And it was kind of like, um, his playing to me was like Hank Mobley's was. It was like yeah. when you didn't want, when you didn't want to listen to Train or, or Rollins, I, I would go immediate to Glass B games to, to, uh, to, to Hank Mobley or, or, or Clifford, you know, because their sound was so different, man, and their approach yeah. it was just gorgeous playing. Boy, what a thrill that must have been, you know. Oh, yeah. What were what were some of the things that Clifford said to you? Oh well, like they'd the be cryptic. cryptic. Yeah. Like one time, one time I made the mistake, I was so stupid, I decided I would drive to the gig at Sweet Basil, and it was Halloween in Greenwich Village. And you, it was stupid. You can't, couldn't park, and it was getting towards 10 o'clock, which was hit time, and I ended up parking up by 14th Street where the meat stuff is, and yeah. running in my suit, you know, like, get in the club probably five after, I was just terrified. I was late for the Art Farmer gig. Five after 10, or two, but every, a lot of people were late because it was Halloween, I didn't realize that. And Clifford said, uh, some, where's the effect, like, don't compound being late by looking late. Like, when you're late, <laughs> you should walk in real slow, like you're a half hour early. Uh, good <laughs> so that was a good lesson. Yeah. Uh, and with the interest, this is interesting. We were up in Boston. It's interesting to me. And a lot of times, it, well, he said it. He said, you know, I know some, a lot of times in this band, it feels like it's five different guys playing five different tempos. He said, you know what you do? And uh, Smitty was playing drums. He said, you ask Smitty a question and you wait for the answer. Hmm. And it was a great lesson because everybody was, it was like everybody talking at the same time. Yeah. And just you know, remembering to hmm. leave that space, but he put it a certain way, you know? Yeah. So it's like a conversation because yeah. I didn't get that right away. So you ask, yeah, I see what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. Cl Clifford yeah. was brilliant and he didn't have to say a lot to, to say something important uh, yeah. playing or, or verbally. Uh, yeah. Raphael, uh, when you hire a trio, um, what, what do you consider important in the, in the drummer and the bassist that you're looking for? Um, I, really, I really don't care. I mean, I think that if, if they work together well, and if they have strong personalities, I don't feel like I need X or Y or Z to come out of them because everyone's different and every combination of people is gonna be a different musical experience. And, and that'll surprise me and hopefully bring out some stuff that, that I hadn't uh, uh, thought of before. So um, as long as everyone is, is relatively strong in their playing and they, and they work together well, um, it's not something that I think about too much. Yeah, well, you do do a great job of hiring uh, musicians. Um, uh, uh, could you could you name uh, who is uh, Philip? Uh, that's Grant Stewart's uh, uh, brother uh, is often there, and uh, you hire some fantastic bass players. It's always a a pleasure. Um, do you have any uh, stories you want to tell about when you were about your dad and about the village gate uh, that you thought might be interesting? There were two rooms. Describe the club a little. There was like an upstairs and a downstairs. I think I've, it's so long. Ago. I'll try to I'll try to tell the short version. You can cut me off. So that my dad started the club in 1958, and the the entrance back then was on actually on Thompson Street, and it was a big cavernous cellar that had been a, a laundromat and so mm. that place was the, was the main place where they had uh, bands and boot nannies and so forth then in 1963 or 4 he built the top of the gate uh, which was a, 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 an additional restaurant uh, it was more of like a, a restaurant with music so the the restaurant and bar were the main thing and the, the music was almost secondary and yet some of the secondary musicians were people like Bill Evans and Monk and, and uh, Teddy Wilson. And uh, so, and I, I can't 
uh, can't tell you how many times people came up to me and they, they'd say, oh, your dad ran the village gate. That was the first place that mm -hmm. let me come in and, and drink when I was underage. Or I sure. could listen to Jackie Byard and, and, and drink one beer for, for six hours. It was the best place. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and <laughs> we were talking about this the other day. I was, I was looking through uh, the very beginning of Herbie Hancock's uh, biography. He, he says, he was talking about like around 1963. It was like, yeah, yeah me and my friends ha uh, went to hang out the ga uh, gate because that's, you know, that's where you'd pick up all the fine women. So that, <laughs> that made me feel better than Hearing about some stupid story that everyone's heard before, uh, and then we also uh, then later on we had a, a sidewalk cafe, uh, which was we called the Terrace, and and both of you guys played there. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith played uh, a week with the um, with uh, Jerry, right? With Jerry, Hard Bop, or I don't remember if it was our band Hard or Bob Jerry and Jim. Clifford Barbro and yeah. them, and then yeah. uh, Tardo did a week, Tardo did a week covering for Mike Ladon, who is booked. And then Mike Ladon uh, couldn't do it, and he got you to cover. And huh. I still, believe it or not, have an, his answering machine message where he called me. Because back then, all the answering machine, met, this is so ins insignificant, but it's funny. Uh, they were all on cassette, and I kept the cassettes. And he's explained, yeah, man, I can't make it, but I, but I got... Uh, you know, I got Tarta Hammer. He's a great trio, and 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 they're gonna cover. And they'll, they'll you'll love them. Uh, so yeah, you guys. And this was a a, a, a cafe with uh, with music on the sidewalk level. And what what happened economically in the '80s, in '88, '89, '90, there was a lot of street traffic, and we did really good business. And around the middle of '91, there was a small recession. And you could just see it in the sheer volume of people walking down the street, and it was just less less audience. And the, you know, when you have a, a business like that, there's nothing you can do. You just sit there and you wait for people to come in, and they mm -hmm. come in or they don't. You handed out flyers too, Raphael. We we did this thing. We had a comedy show, and we uh, the guy who who ran the comedy show with me was this guy named Manny Roth, who who was a sort of a legendary club owner from the 60s and and we had um we did this thing where we had a comedy show and we charged ten dollars but we were really happy to get eight so we'd hand out these flyers <laughs> that said the show's ten dollars but you know if you use this flyer it's eight bucks and people were like oh cool so you know um a little jewish economics for you people <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I was still curious. I, I looked online. I've seen the less about you uh, bio-wise. So, and I've known you for years as a fantastic pianist, but I still don't know when, when you know, you were doing that with your dad in the club. I think it was right across from the Blue Note, where the Blue Note is now. Is that correct? Uh, it's across from, no, it was across from where Amando Kane was. Blue uh, Note is on third and Gate was on Bleecker. Across from yeah. the Surf Maid. Uh, the Surf Maid, yeah. Okay, because it was a really famous... Did you play the Surf oh. Maid, either of you guys? Yeah, I played the Surf Maid. Wow. Yeah, with Ted Wall. You played the Surf Maid, no. uh, uh, Richie? I don't know. I don't believe it I did. It was a place that had um, a piano, and you could actually, if you were a customer, you could sit at a table around the piano. Uh, on Monday nights, they had a guy that was named Claude who would do oh, his yeah. piano bar, sing along. But other nights, they would have like Fred Hirsch or Joanne Brackeen. And I remember they had this one guy. Um, he had a funny name. I don't know if either of you guys remember. His name was Bliss Rodriguez. I and remember was, him. You rem yeah, remember? Yeah, he was a guy. Yeah, and he yeah. was very creative. He played a lot yeah. of interesting bass lines. And, and it was a thing where like they would hire really good people. And I don't know if they, they paid okay and the, the food was okay or... I worked there. I think I made a single digit amount, like on Thursday, playing with, uh, playing with Ted Wald. Yeah, but back then. Yeah, no, yeah. It was about like now. I met C Sharp down there. He came walking wow. in and played. He, I fell off the bench. I never heard anything like that, you know. Wow. Yeah, the single digit days, I made $7 in Boston. But w what we did was after like about five nights of that, not in a row, because nobody would hire guys 
five nights in a row for seven dollars a man but that adds up though we, we yeah. took a car and pulled in the back and we stole everything that we, we could take cheese i'm confessing to a crime yeah <laughs> we took out toilet paper beer uh wine you have uh, the right anything to and we had like a two-week party in boston it was so fun i mean you know just but uh, Raphael, when did you actually start playing uh, the piano? I, I don't know that about you. Like, were, well, you I basically, my, my life has been like playing the piano for a few years, hearing somebody really good and, and giving up for a, a, a year and then realizing I suck at everything else. So I might as well just continue <laughs> yeah. hearing someone else really good and going, oh, why bother? I can and relate. Then, you know, it's, so it's that's like my I, I'm learning Spanish. Also modest. That's really the way the way it is, uh, I didn't, um, it's one of those things that like, at some point I realized, well, I, I might as well do this as, as anything else. And uh, so. Yeah, it's amazing how many musicians are really good at just that and they can't get a day gig. You know, I've, I've uh, <laughs> done a whole bunch of different things. And I think that's why uh, Drew's, uh, Glenn Drew's great trumpet player. And he says, man, you're the Renaissance man. I'm over there fishing and I'm, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm kayaking and I'm learning how to use Sibelius and Final Cut Pro. And I just love computers. And, and that's why I'm the moderator here, by the way, guys. So anytime you guys want to cross talk, I, I appreciate it. I'm just yeah. really good with Mac computers. That's why I love doing this. And I figured it's a good break for people shut in from the whole COVID thing uh, to have yeah. this kind of, um, by the way, uh, Tard, I'd like to ask you about comping. That's something okay. uh, I've taken, not paid lessons, but guys, whenever I get a chance with Sinatra's piano player, I'd hang with him an hour. Uh, Gary Dial, Ladon, Keith Saunders, Keith O, and, and it helps, but it's kind of like what Raphael was saying. It's like my Spanish, like I practice really hard and then I like give it up and it sucks and then I get back to it. And I think what Magnarelli said to me, he says, I practice piano every day. So I'm starting to take, a, take it uh, to practice, make sure I do like 20 minutes every day. And if it turns into an hour, it's like going to the gym, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you, right. if you say to yourself as a non-pianist, I'm going to practice an hour a day, I mean, it's we'll like, a, it's like doing a thousand sit-ups. You're not going to do, okay, yeah, good place to start. No, start with like 20 the and then build it up. But yeah. how, do you, how do you learn to comp, you know, as well as you, I mean, you guys are great compers and it's just, such an art and there's books out on it and i buy the books and the chord changes are too small or it's starting with boogie woogie with tents and i'm going jesus christ what i'd like to do someday is get some of you cats and actually record you copying on two choruses of a song and and then on the blues and then make a transcription of it and say guys this is what a real piano player does. But what would you advise to non-piano players or 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 medium piano players to learn how to comp yeah, that's a well, good question. I'll take a couple of attempts at it and then maybe pass it around to these guys. That's a good uh, idea. One thing, it sounds simple. You really have to listen. Now, I was, I had a COVID. Well, that's hard. I'm, yeah. Now I'm giving up. So. <laughs> <laughs> but to really listen, because you can step on the other person's, the soloist's lines very easily. You could play higher. You could play right on it. You could be redundant. So you ha And rhythmically, you have to kind of be... Uh, conversational. So how do you do that? I don't know. But I'll tell you this. I was I had to make a, a comping part and send it to somebody for a recording they wanted to do where we just kind of recorded on a I recorded on my phone at home and I emailed it in, and it sounds so bad to me because I wasn't hearing what the melody was going to be when I did it. So it sounds not bad, but it just sounds blind. Like it doesn't know what's it doesn't know what's going on around it. You know, it sounds contrived. Bad word for that. It sounds dis disassociated from what's going on around it. So listening. Uh, I think you have to be spare, meaning it doesn't help to play a bunch of octaves and doubled up notes and, and because whenever you do that, you're emphasizing a tone. Mm. And just also when you alter chords or you add, extend chords, you do something very special to a chord specific like that, you may be stepping on the soloist lines as well. So you have to be spare about that. And other than that, I would say voice leading is the most important thing that the horizontal movement of the individual parts of the chords you play has to, has to be sensible. Does that help you? Do you do compose also? You compose your own songs, Todd? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. And uh, does that help the whole voice leading thing with writing? 
I think voice leading helps everything. I mean, yeah. I think you're lost without it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good. But answer. I'd like to know what these guys think about comping because I yeah, hard well, to put into words. Thank you, Keith. What, what do you what do you ha have? Um, what do you think about comping? Uh, by the way, and um, so it's uh, always the been the hardest part. I think it's the most difficult thing about being a pianist. Is so uh, I I agree with everything Tardo said. Voice leading so important. Listening to other pianos, uh, pianists like Sonny Clark or mm -hmm. Wynton Kelly, people who are masters at, at accompanying. Um, the other thing you could be, uh, I mean, this is this is hard to, but different players are going to require different uh, yeah. amounts, amount yeah. of comping and different style of comping. So you're going to have to listen real hard to who you're playing with. And also the rhythm section, you know, you're going to comp differently with a different drummer mm -hmm. and, and different mm. bass player. For me, especially the drummer is, is going to, is going to, cause for instance, some drummers really hit hard on the end, on the upbeats, on the, on the end of four, um, others don't. So if, if I, if I'm coming down hard on, on, on a downbeat and he's on, we're flamming, you know, so I got to like, um, pick my spots, you know, I, I can't, yeah. um, you know, upbeat's always very important to, to music, you know, cause that, that gives you that forward thrust, right? But, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, different people are going to affect the way you play. I, I, I try to play less, especially in situations where I don't know the people that well, you know, try to figure out what they're And, and uh, is there a difference between the way you count behind a singer and a horn player? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have to be um, more um, muscular behind horn players, and you you could be a little bit more aggressive. Singers need, you know, more more finesse, and um, you need to take your volume first. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's uh, it, that singers are that that's the hardest. That that's even harder than than comping behind a horn player, a singer, because it's, yeah. it's so. And, and going towards what Tardo said, I was uh, recording, you know, I'm kind of proud of my writing. I learned to write. A lot of it was from being in Chris Byers' uh, uh, octet. He allowed me to write and actually recorded one of the songs I wrote called Village Beauty. And writing for an octet means, <clears throat> means I had three horns. So I have the third and the seventh covered, you know. So it was, it's a lot hipper in, a, in ways than writing for just two horns. Uh, it, it's and uh, actually, forgive me, octet was five horns, so you've got the third, the seventh, and then you could get all these other interesting notes. But I, what I was doing um, a month ago was I was recording myself to play a ballad, and uh, and then I put it up on YouTube or Facebook, and and I did all the comping on GarageBand or Logic, one of the um recording uh, apps that I have on my computer. And I said, wow, that sounds real good. And just like Tardo was saying, then I started playing over it and then I listened to it back and it was complete, it sounded weird. It was like contrived because I think next time I should play the horn, play the melody, play the solo and then comp over it maybe. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's no way without, the, the, you guys are spontaneous when you comp, but my facility isn't, at that point. So what, what I'll probably do next time is record the, um, the solo and then try comping over it. Fortunately, I could slow things down in, in Logic, but uh, once, you, once you actually record the trumpet, you can't do that. You can't slow that down. It's, anyways, I'm going uh, to an aside a little, just thinking <laughs> about comping myself, you know. So uh, Raphael, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts? And it's kind of hard being the third person on a question, so I apologize. What are your I thoughts? Th I think the first two guys uh, pretty much covered it. Um, the thing is when I remember asking this question when I was still starting to figure it all out and, and the teacher would say, listen, and that, and that doesn't really, it, it's not enough to say that to someone who's starting because like, well, what am I listening for? And, and I need, listening is not enough if you don't have a vocabulary of, of stuff. And, uh, you know, but I, I mean, I totally agree with playing, playing, playing less, uh, always a little less than you should. Uh, but I just want to make a quick analogy. Uh, 
yeah, I hope this makes sense or either makes sense or be stupid. Uh, so I took some improv uh, acting classes in the mid 2000s and they would say, well, always listen to what your partner is saying and listen. And it's true that you have to listen, but some, at, some, at some point you have to take a stand and be bold and do something. And, and, and because you're adding to the, to the overall texture of the music and it might sound like shit, but it might like propel the action further. And, and you know, you do have to take a stand and do something uh, and, and say, boom, uh, for better <clears throat> or worse. And, and knowing when to do that is, it, it takes, it takes, it took, it takes a long time for me. Great, great. Oh, I like that. Uh, Rafi reminds me of one thing that I always say that everything you say about music, the opposite is also probably going to be true. So listen, and guess what? Don't listen. Sometimes you have to not listen. I mean, I don't recommend it as a way of life. <laughs> but like, on occasion, it's, it's, it's necessary. And, and, it's interesting and because, getting back to what Keith was saying about different solos want, soloists want, want different things. I mean, I find that sometimes a soloist will say, hey man, play less. Or sometimes like, hey, you can, no, I want more, I want more stuff to, to react off of. So it depends, mm -hmm. you never know what the other person wants. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was and I think gonna people feel the same way about drummers. Sometimes some people want uh, a lot of the cool school players wanted the drums to sit back, and and then other people want, hey, let the drummer do what he wants. I want to be spurred onwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of fun being a leader because sometimes my drummer will, after the saxophone solo, pull back too much, and I'll say no. Uh, it's like I'm starting from square one. Right. And uh, but then sometimes it's really nice. It's like after Coltrane, you come into Miles with a harmony mute. I get that. But the advantage of being a leader is sometimes I could I could experiment with it and say, hey, give me a little more. Don't drop the the um, intensity so much. And then sometimes it's really nice because you want to have a spotty solo. Uh, so uh, the comping is there's just so much to it. There's double handed uh, no. A root, rootless comping with two hands. There's the way you guys comp with one hand while you're soloing. There's shell voicings. There's rootless voicings with the left hand. There's just so much to learn. It's it's so beautiful. And yet, like trumpet's really a hard instrument physically. But I look at the piano and I go, Jesus, there's a lot going on here. You know, it really it is daunting at times. And and I really appreciate the way you three guys play. It's just fantastic. It's uh, no picnic. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Tardle, I didn't realize until I did this, uh, look, was looking up the, the bios and the information on everybody, we have the same first name. You know? That's true. And we're I never both, knew And that. we're both bald. Yeah, well, yeah, that's okay. true, too. A lot of things and, in common uh, there. Yeah, mine is uh, by choice, I think. Part really? Do you think you have hair there if you let it go? Well, I do someplace here. I can feel it. Yeah, I got some, too. I don't know if but, you uh, it's not a lot. But, uh, Keith, uh, Keith, Keith is catching up. Keith is getting there. As as know, it, this too. is the baldest podcast ever. Yeah. Like, it's a good Jack Nicholson look. It's, it's, somebody yeah, told yeah. me if it doesn't look like 40 miles of bad road you're in. So I'm, I'm very happy with it, you know. Yeah. Uh, Tard, how did you come up with – how did you get your nickname, Tard? Well, just, I think I blame a guy named Adrian Ippolito, but it was a bunch of guys, you know. Okay. Yeah, uh, no. I'm not sure how. I'm not really it, sure how it came about, but you know, I'll tell you this: if your name was Richard, and you may know this, in those days, I'm talking about late '60s, early, you're, they would call you Dick. No, I didn't allow that. Yeah, a lot of people call you <laughs> Dick. So when the option Tardo came along, I said that I was a little more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually fitting, and I and yeah. it doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't even mean anything. No. I'm always enthralled with nicknames. I mean, they are so cool. It's like I think mm -hmm. it was a. Uh, 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 Lester Young used to get a nickname for every, like Lady Day, you know, Lady, and he would have a nickname for everybody. It's so cool, you know. Well, actually, can I just say, I Please. remember the first time I heard Tardo's name. <clears throat> I think it was um, uh, Ari Rowland was was saying, "Oh, you got to hear this guy Tardo Hammer," and he said the name, and I figured, "Oh, some European." Pian hotshot pianist and of course See? talking about a guy who was born and bred in new york city so yeah should i should have developed an accent and uh and dressed and in some Hama. french and, and clothes and i could have i could have spelled it with an e-a-u-x and who knows what would have happened <laughs> cool well gentlemen we've been on for almost an hour and um 
I'm going to uh, wrap this up now. I want to thank my guests, uh, Tardo Hammer and Keith Saunders and uh, Raphael DeLugoff for coming on our show. But most of all, I'd like to thank our fans out there for taking the time to watch the show. Uh, my next show, hopefully, Facebook uh, will lift the moratorium on my live streaming lockdown and I'll, I'll be able to do the show live as opposed to almost live like today. So, folks, thanks for watching. And once again, I'd like to thank my three magnificent guests, Tardo, Kito, and Raphael. And uh, as we reopen the hunt, uh, country, please uh, stay safe. And we hope to see you all live in a jazz club of your choice soon. So, so long, folks. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Ta-ta. All right.